thanks to all of you for joining us. And uh, we are going to be uh, asking our expert today, Dr. Uh, Rasmussen from uh, Columbia, a uh, virologist, and uh, just want to kick things off. Can you tell us a little bit about um, COVID-19, uh, how it spreads, and, and how it affects people? Sure. So COVID-19 is thought to be primarily transmitted by respiratory droplets um, or contact. So what that means is that when you cough, sneeze, breathe, speak, sing, um, open your mouth and project air out through it, um, you are creating droplets. And actually, compared to aerosols, which I know have been discussed a lot, those droplets are actually quite large. So this usually means um, that you would be exposing somebody or you would get infected by inhaling these droplets or by getting them on your hands um, mm -hmm. and then touching your face, your mouth, your nose. Um, you can also contract the virus by touching a surface that has those droplets on them with infectious virus in it. And in some hospital situations, um, typically in critical care units where patients are being intubated, um, or, or undergoing other types of aerosol generating procedures. In those cases, the virus can be airborne um, in, the, in the form of small particle aerosols. But primarily and, and, among people, um, it, it is transmitted by respiratory droplets. Got it. And, and can you explain a little bit about, um, you know, when you're infected with this virus, uh, like what is it, what is it doing um, in, in people and how is it affecting them? Sure. So there's still a lot. I will start off by saying there's still a lot that we don't know about pathogenesis, mm -hmm. which is the process by which the virus causes disease. But we do know um, essentially what coronaviruses do when they get into you. So they um, will look for a cell or they happen upon a cell that has what we call the receptor. And the virus particles have a protein on the surface called spike, which is a great name. Um, that binds this receptor and allows the virus to get into the cell. Once the virus is in the cell, it begins to copy itself. So it replicates its genome, it makes viral proteins, and those get packaged up around a copy of the viral genome, and then those leave the cell and go on to infect another cell. What we don't know um, are the specific types of host responses that contribute likely to um, the severity of the disease. So in some people, uh, they will have a host response that allows for the virus to be controlled, um, kept in the area where it is, and cleared. Um, other people, for reasons we don't understand, will have a sort of uncontrolled immune response. Um, and that's where people end up with the disease that we call COVID, uh, which is um, in its most severe form characterized by a very specific type of pneumonia. Got it. And, and can you explain a little bit for, for the audiences, what, what's the difference between a, a coronavirus, like, like the one that causes COVID, um, and other viruses like, like the flu or, uh, or other things that might make you sick? So viruses, um, unlike most other species on Earth, all other species on Earth, have distinct evolutionary origins for their individual families. So coronaviruses are one family of virus. Um, Coronaviruses are a type of virus called an RNA virus. Um, that means their genome is made of a molecule called RNA instead of DNA. There are a number of other RNA viruses, but they're not related. For example, influenza is also an RNA virus. Um, however, the influenza genome is divided into eight segments, whereas the coronavirus genome is just one single segment. Um, and there are many different types of viruses that have all evolved independently um, to be within their own families. So coronaviruses like original SARS, SARS classic, um, mm -hmm. MERS coronavirus, and now this SARS coronavirus 2 are all members of the same family and evolved from a common ancestor. Uh, got it. And, and for those of you just joining us, we're here with Dr. Uh, Angela Rasmussen, a virologist, um, talking about the basics of uh, the COVID-19 virus. Um, we are uh, looking to take your questions, and we'll be answering some of those soon. Um, did want to just uh, hop in with a couple more questions for you, doctor. Um, can you tell us what, why is it called a coronavirus? Is there a particular reason for the name? Yeah. So it's called a coronavirus because that spike protein that I mentioned earlier, um, mm -hmm. it is what it, what it sounds like. It's a spike in the outside of the envelope, which is a layer of um, membrane that surrounds the virus particle. And when you look at that, 
when you look at those virus particles under an electron microscope, uh, which can see very, very small things like viruses, um, it looks like a crown um, or the corona of the sun. Um, so that's, that's where the name came from. Corona means crown in Latin. Got it. Um, and, you know, I've kind of seen a, a, a couple of uh, common questions from uh, uh, the audience uh, coming up. Uh, so uh, I think one really common question is that if someone um, gets the virus, gets infected, about how long does it take for it to run its course? Do we, do we have a lot of data on that yet? We don't. We're still collecting that data. And that's the type of thing that um, there are a lot of variables that can contribute to that. One thing is how severe the disease is. So for people mm -hmm. who have very mild disease, it might only last a couple of days. Um, people who have much more severe disease, um, that could be much more prolonged. And we're only still learning about some of the, the sequelae um, or the, the things that happen after you recover from a severe case of, of COVID-19. Um, so there have been suggestions that some people with very severe disease might have reduced lung capacity, might have permanent damage to their respiratory tract. And we're only beginning to learn about that as more patients recover. Got it. And um, another question uh, from the audience, can, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned that the virus transmits through droplets. So uh, is it, would it be possible to contract it from, from like surfaces, um, uh, you know, objects in a room, things like that? Uh, you know, should we be wiping down our groceries when we get them home? Uh, you know, what, what do we know about that so far? Yeah, so that's a pretty hot topic, um, and we are still learning a lot about how the virus persists in the environment, um, but you can contract the virus um, from fomites, which are surfaces that have been contaminated, uh, mm -hmm. at least we think so. Um, while the majority of transmission is probably from respiratory droplets, uh, there, fomite transmission is certainly a possibility. Um, we do know that on certain surfaces, the virus lasts longer than others. Um, it lasts longer on smooth surfaces like stainless mm -hmm. steel and plastic than it does on, uh, on more textured surfaces. Also, temperature and humidity play a large role in how long the virus can persist. So what I've been telling people about the grocery thing is that um, certainly it doesn't hurt to wipe down things that have been packaged in plastic um, or some material that uh, is, you know, not going to absorb a bunch of disinfectant like paper. Um, but the, the thing that everybody can do that, that will help reduce risk of fomite transmission from groceries or packages is to just wash your hands after you're done handling those. Um, it is a good idea to keep common surfaces like doorknobs and kitchen counters, things like that disinfected. Got it. And, um, uh, you know, you, you kind of mentioned the temperature and humidity play a role, and I think as we're moving into spring and summertime, at least in the northern hemisphere, uh, I think people are curious about, you know, is this going to be something that impacts, like, how fast the disease spreads? Um, you know, can we expect it to decrease in warmer weather, or, or are we not sure yet? We're not sure yet. Um, certainly, a warmer um, weather and higher temperatures, higher humidity in some places – may um, prevent the virus from sticking around in the environment for as long as it can in other climates. But the majority of transmission, we think, is really from person to person. And people um, live in plenty of hot and humid places that have cases of COVID-19. Um, Singapore, for example, where it's very hot and very humid all year round, uh, they've still had um, transmission in Singapore. The only thing that has prevented really um, larger scale transmission in Singapore are their very strict quarantine measures and social distancing um, protocols. So, uh, so we don't know if um, it's seasonal yet. So, uh, you know, in, in talking about social distancing and quarantine, which, you know, uh, as you see, I'm broadcasting from my, uh, my home office here, and I'm uh, sure you're similar. Um, you know, one of the reasons for that is because, you know, there's no vaccine for this illness yet. And uh, as far as I know, no approved vaccine for, for any of the, the major coronaviruses that have uh, popped up over the last couple of decades. Um, do you have an idea just based on, you know, experience in other illnesses, like when might it be realistic to expect, you know, a, a vaccine that could that could be taken by a significant number of people? So I would say probably 18 months 
Um, assuming that this vaccine that has started clinical trials works, there are several other vaccines in the pipeline. The problem with vaccines is that they really can't be rushed. Um, we only knew mm -hmm. about this virus a couple months ago. We didn't know that it even existed before that. So um, any vaccine is going to have to essentially start from scratch. So they've already started in Seattle vaccine trials of an mRNA vaccine that was designed and made very quickly. But unfortunately, you just can't rush the process by which you assess safety and efficacy. People have to be given the vaccine and we have to observe them over time to see how their immune um, responses go. We need to make sure that the vaccine can induce, um, safely induce protective immunity. And the only way to do that is by following people for several months. Got it. Thank you. And I think we have time for just uh, one more question. Um, and, and, and that question is about uh, what some people are talking with, uh, some of the uh, uh, treatments that have been used for malaria. There have been some case reports uh, out of France and China that uh, these might be effective treatments. Uh, but then there was a, another controlled study that came out that indicated that it might not make a difference. Um, how much, you know, research do we need uh, on these anti-malarial drugs uh, to see if they're effective? And, um, you know, what do you think the chances are that it, that it actually is just based on what we know so far? It's really hard to say how effective they are right now because all of the studies that you mentioned were with a very small number of patients. And mm. the problem with doing that is that we're all different people. Um, we all have our own individual susceptibilities um, to infection and responses to treatment. So when you're looking at a drug in a clinical trial like this, it needs to be a much larger group of patients in order to determine that. Um, the good news is that uh, those trials are ongoing. The WHO has coordinated a very large trial across multiple countries and sites um, looking at both of both the hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, as well as um, remdesivir, which is a different drug, uh, mm -hmm. as well as um, some HIV protease inhibitors that have also been suggested to work, um, but were not shown to be effective in a small uh, controlled trial. So um, I, I would think that in the next few months, we're gonna start seeing a lot of that trial data. Obviously, it's a priority to analyze that and to determine safety and efficacy of all of those drug candidates as soon as possible. All right. Well, well, Dr. Rasmussen, thank you so much. I think it's uh, all the time we have today. I want to thank Dr. Rasmussen for your time. Thanks to all of you for watching. Thanks for having me here, Alex. Thanks, everybody.